Hey, my name is Jeremy and I'm the campus pastor at the 288 campus. And I'm excited that you're taking this journey with us as we're looking at several of the parables Jesus used to teach while he was physically here on earth. I pray they've been good lessons or maybe good reminders of how to live in this world that is not our home, but desperately needs us to bring as much of the kingdom of God to it as possible. So people would see our good deeds, God would be glorified by them, and we would have the chance to point them towards him. I've got a fun one for you today. So let's start by praying for a second, and then we'll dive in. Lord, thank you for these moments together in Scripture. Thank you for what your word teaches us. I pray that our hearts will be ready to hear from you today, what you want to say to us individually and as a group, Lord. Thank you so much for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I was working in my home office not too awful long ago, and something caught my eye. So I walked over to this basket on a shelf, and I realized I was looking at an old portable DVD player that we bought back when our kids were much, much younger. Come on, look at this thing. Look at that, look at that. And next to it was this handful of old DVDs. Well, I probably don't need to tell you they're old, but they're old DVDs, so that's a given. So I started glancing through the titles, and it was like a trip down memory lane for me. I found the classic Beethoven, everybody loves that one. Uh, the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything, always, always good as well, and a copy of Cars. And I was reminded that years ago, I would leave for work in the mornings and a couple of our older kids would head to school and one of our younger kids who was not yet school age would crawl up on the couch with my wife and they would watch Cars every single morning. That was their, that was their little thing. Wouldn't you know it that in this handful of DVDs in my office was a copy of Cars itself and it reminded me vividly of that little morning routine but I could not figure out why in the world I still have a DVD player and a copy of Cars. No one's pulling those things out now. I can't even tell you the last time anybody used that DVD player or the last time anybody watched Cars in my house from a DVD. I can tell you this, it's something we should have gotten rid of a long time ago. It's well past time to let go of that thing. But I, I don't think I'm alone. In fact, I have a question for you. And if you're watching this with your life group, feel free to pause and discuss your answers. Now, before I ask the question, you are not allowed to answer with the following responses. My kids, my husband, or my wife. Are you ready for the question? You know the ground rules. Okay, what do you have in your house right now that you should have moved on from years ago, but you just haven't? Do you have a basket of random cords or cables just in case? How about that pair of jeans that used to fit and your fingers crossed, hoping this is the year the diet works and they'll fit again? or a shirt that's broken in, which just means it has holes in it, but it's still comfortable, it reminds you of something. Feel free to press pause and discuss that ridiculous thing that you still have in your house. Okay, that's the frame of mind I want you to take into our discussion around the parable of the unforgiving servant, that there are things that we really need to get rid of in our life, things that are not helping us live every day to know Christ and to make him known. Remember, like the other ones, this parable uses a story to illustrate a truth of Scripture. So let's pick this one up in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on the details here. Some verses say 70 times seven, some say 77. That's not the point. The point of this exchange is this. Peter's initial question was what? How many times do I have to forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Peter here is giving voice to a question that we've all wrestled with and maybe on a regular basis. God, do I have to forgive them again? Again? They just keep doing the same thing over and over and it hurts me every time. Now, I don't wanna minimize how painful it can be when someone we, we love hurts us. It cuts so much deeper than a random sin from some random guy in line at your local HEB. This is personal and we hurt. That's the heart of this question from Peter. How many times do I need to forgive someone who hurts me? Jesus answers with a parable, starting in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Okay, pause there. In this story, the king is a symbol of God. He has some people in his kingdom who owe him a debt. Wanna guess who they are? It's us, it's you and me. We owe a debt that we can't pay. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Verse 24 says, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Again, like I encouraged you to do earlier, don't get hung up on the details in the story. They're exaggerated to overprove the point. Like when I reach in the back of my wife's car and grab three bags from her most recent target run and declare, man, these things weigh a ton. They don't actually weigh a ton, they're close. 
but not actually a ton. That's, that's what, and that's how Jesus is communicating here. This man owed a massive debt. All right, so back to the parable, verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So this man owed a debt that would be considered unpayable. Again, that's us. We owe a debt in God's kingdom that is utterly unpayable. I don't normally recommend trying to see yourself in every story in the Bible because the Bible really isn't about us. It's about Jesus. But do you see yourself in this story a little bit? Okay, back to it. Verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity, some translations say compassion on him, and canceled the debt and let him go. Now, if you're a Christ follower, you can resonate with this moment. At some point, you realize that you owed a debt that you simply could not pay, and you began to ask for mercy. And the king said over you, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Your sin debt was canceled, and you were turned loose to live a brand new life. If you, if you haven't taken that step of faith and put your trust in God, if you haven't asked him to forgive your sins, you're going to have a chance to do that in just a moment. And it's an amazing trade. Lord, here's all of my past, all of my sin, all of my stupid mistakes. Here's all of it. I owe a debt that I simply cannot pay. And the King of Kings cancels that debt. It's paid for. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And the Aramaic word he said actually means the debt is settled and paid for in full. When, when I was in college when I met Heather, who'd become my wife, and I found out she drove a bright yellow vet. Sunroof, four-speed, manual. Oh my goodness. Turns out it was a Chevette and not a Corvette. Not even a Chevelle, a Chevette. But here's the thing. I had no car at all, so that yellow Chevette was an upgrade for me. Eventually, we bought our first car together, and we took out a loan from a local bank and started making monthly payments in person by check. You remember those days? In that little local bank. And we diligently made those payments every single month. And I remember writing the final check. And in the memo line, you know that bottom left corner part of the check? I wrote paid in full. Felt amazing knowing I was, wasn't going to have to make that payment ever again. The account was settled. That's what it's like when we bring our sin debt to Christ. He has already paid it in full. We don't owe that debt anymore. Our account has been settled. So how do we respond? Throw a party, celebrate, and then go live our life walking towards God, not away from Him like we had been doing our whole life up to that point. Go and live differently. But how did the man in this parable respond? Let's see in verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. This man had been forgiven a debt that he never could have repaid. And when he found a man who owed him a debt as well, again, don't get caught up in the details, but this was a relatively small debt. Instead of exercising a single ounce of grace or mercy, he responded harshly and began to choke him refused to show mercy, refused to forgive the debt, or even show patience with him. I'm so thankful that God deals with me, with, with us, as the king in this story, and not like the man who'd been forgiven so much. Do you remember the initial question by Peter that started this whole passage? How many times do I have to forgive? Jesus tells this whole parable in response to that question. Not how many times does God forgive? How many times do I need to forgive? This whole parable is Jesus saying to us, God is ready to forgive you of everything. Now go and forgive those who sin against you, who hurt you. The first time they hurt you, forgive. The hundredth time they hurt you, forgive. We know that in our head and we know in our heart, but that does not make it easy, especially when someone has hurt us over and over and over. Okay, back to where we started. Remember I asked you to think about that ridiculous thing that's still in your house and you're not even sure why, that one thing you need to move on from to let go? Here's why we started there. Is there anyone in your life that you're holding onto their sin against you? You forget sometimes that it's even there and you stumble across it and you realize you need to get rid of it. It's not helping you or them not to forgive, but your sense of justice will not let you forgive them. Not until they get what's coming to them. They owe me. I'm not going to extend grace or patience to them. Not until they pay for what they did. Are you seeing where this is going? Have you heard the, heard the age old statement that holding on to unforgiveness against someone is like drinking poison and hoping it will hurt your enemy? It doesn't work. What do you need to move on from today? We have been forgiven so much. Let's extend that same forgiveness to those who have hurt us. Forgiving does not minimize the damage of the sin. 
It does not mean you trust them not to hurt you again. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends with them or even be friends. But forgiving is the first step in showing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So forgive today. Just let it go. Trust the God of justice, the, the same one who forgave you, to work in their life. We've been forgiven so much. Forgive in the same manner. As a real reminder to always be forgiving, I want to encourage you that every time you throw away something you're done with, like I should have done a long time ago with that DVD player, stop for a second and ask God, is there anyone I need to forgive? Any unforgiveness I need to throw away as well? And then trust God to help you do it. And if you haven't placed your trust in God, if you don't know what his forgiveness is like, let me encourage you to take that step right now. You owe a debt you will not ever be able to pay, but he is ready to cancel that debt. Trust him with your past. Let it be finished. Okay. I'm going to turn you back to your group. You can discuss questions and, and go all the way through the lesson. But let me finish by praying, and I'll turn you loose. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this reminder that you canceled our debt, that we owed something we could never pay back, and you loved us. You, thought, you saw us as worth it, and you canceled our debt. Help us, God, to forgive in the same manner. We're not you, so this is a lot harder for us, God. We tend to hold on to things. Help us to get rid of them quickly. Lord, help us to... Uh, even as we pray together tonight, that you would remind us of some things in our life that we need to forgive, some people, some moments, and help us to forgive well, Lord. Help us to, to, to be like the king in the story who forgives quickly and easily. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Love you guys. I'm going to turn you back to your group now.